Okay, um, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone to our first keywords conversation of uh, the year, 2011, uh, fall 2011. Um, this conversation is on movements, the keyword movements. Um, and before I hand off the program to uh, our moderator, Janet Jacobson, I just want to briefly tell you a little bit about the center, who we are and what we do in case you um, haven't been to any of the programs that we did last year. Essentially, we are three things. We are a group of people, a space for innovative working and thinking, and an intellectual project. The first, a group of people. CCASD is uh, uh, the product of an ambitious collaboration among five different institutes and centers here at Columbia the Institute for Research in African American Studies, the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. We are faculty here at Columbia and beyond. We are independent scholars, as well as artists and practitioners, who all have an investment in interdisciplinarity and a commitment to exploring innovative ways of thinking about the role of gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and race in global dynamics of power and inequality. CCASD is also a space. We are a unique space for working and thinking in new ways, not just here at Columbia in New York City and at Columbia's global centers, but also far beyond the university. We have a deep commitment here to critical global perspectives that we hope will enable us to think differently about social difference. Finally, we are here at CCASD, an intellectual project that is fully preoccupied with the critical analysis of social difference. I want to invite everyone to visit our website, socialdifference.org, to learn more about what we do and also to read about um, our five working projects that we have currently, Liberalism and its Others, Engendering the Archive, Towards an Intellectual History of Black Women, Borders and Boundaries, and our newest project, The Future of Disability Studies. I also want to encourage everyone to attend um, Injured Cities, Urban Afterlives, which is our archive project's international conference on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Um, Injured Cities, Urban Afterlives will be happening here at Columbia October 14th through 15th. Each of our working projects here at CCASD is invested in looking at social difference in a wide range of domains and also from a wide range of locations. For example, the production of archives, um, the lives of those at the social margins in neoliberal locations or across national borders, the organization of stigma, uh, injury, violence, and these are just a few of many examples. And because we are looking at social difference always in a way that's informed by our unique disciplinary locations and theoretical investments, we can actually get a lot out of talking keywords with each other. Um, uh, exposing the different kinds of work our critical languages do and throwing various modes of looking right up against each other. Hence keywords. That's really how we see this, uh, this series. Today we're taking on the keyword movements. Um, and finally, before we begin, I just want to give you all a couple of quick biographies of our distinguished participants in this conversation. Uh, our moderator, Janet Jacobson, is director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women and Ann Whitney Olin Professor of Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Barnard College, Columbia University, where she has also served as Dean for Faculty Diversity and Development. She is the author of Working Alliances and the Politics of Difference, Diversity and Feminist Ethics, 
with Anne Pellegrini. She's the author of Love the Sin, Sexual Regulation and the Limits of Religious Tolerance, an editor of Secularisms, and with uh, Elizabeth Castelli, she is editor of Interventions, Academics and Activists Respond to Violence. Before entering the academy, she was a policy analyst and organizer in Washington, D.C. Paul Scolieri is an assistant professor of dance at Barnard College. His primary areas of research and teaching include world dance studies, Latin American and Caribbean dance history, performance theory, and movement analysis. He is the author of Dances of Death, Aztec and Spanish Encounters in the New World, a study of the relationship between choreography and historiography in the discovery, conquest, and colonization of the Americas, forthcoming in 2012 with the University of Texas Press. He's currently working on a new book entitled Decoding the Dance, uh, the Life, Writings, and Dances of Ted Sean, a study of the father of American dance in relation to the discourses of eugenics, modernism, and sexology. Lila Abulugod is direct, I'm bouncing around a little bit. <laughs> Lila Abulugod is director of the Center for the Critical Analysis of Social Difference, Joseph L. Butenweiser Professor of Social Science and Director of Graduate Studies at the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. Uh, Professor Abulugod's work, strongly ethnographic and mostly based in Egypt, has focused on three broad issues the relationship between cultural forms and power, the politics of knowledge and representation, and the dynamics of gender and the question of women's rights in the Middle East. Her published anthropological monographs include Veiled Sentiments about the politics of sentiment and cultural expression in a Bedouin community in Egypt, Writing Women's Worlds, framed as a feminist ethnography that uses individual stories to make a larger argument about writing against culture, and Dreams of Nationhood, The Politics of Television in Egypt, a contribution to the anthropology of nations and to media ethnography. And she's currently completing a book titled, Do Muslims Need Saving? Uh, I'm now very embarrassed because I can't find my biography of Dorian Warren. <laughs> um, Dorian, <This> what, no. <laughs> do you think you could give us a quick, maybe, biography? I can't believe it's not on my piece of paper. Sure. Here. I'm Dorian Warren. I teach uh, political science here at Columbia University, and I'm also in the School of International and Public Affairs and affiliated with the Institute for Research in African American Studies, where I'm also director of undergraduate studies this year. Excellent. Is, Better than I could ever have done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dorian. And now I will pass uh, the program over to Janet Jacobson. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming here at the end of summer, um, <laughs> which the room You're certainly reflects. So. Um, that's good. I'm very happy to uh, be able to um, be here and participate in um, the discussion of this particular keywords. I was last spring um, on the CCSD Executive Committee, and so what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about why we came to this particular word and what we hope it will do. Um, first, I want to thank Laura um, for her great organizational capabilities and uh, for pulling us all together, um, uh, especially because I kind of dropped out on her at the last minute. So thank you very much. And also Marianne Hirsch, who was director of CCASD um, in the spring when we got this set up, and Lila for both being director this semester and participating on our panel. Um, what Laura said, I think, is really crucial to how we came to this particular uh, keywords conversation, which is that we want to focus on the type of work that our critical languages do. And when we were um, meeting to discuss what the next keyword conversation should be, there were a number of suggestions in what you might call generally sort of a family of terms. So movements being one, obviously. Activism also had a number of proponents who thought that we should focus perhaps on activism. There were some proponents for revolution um, as a keyword, of course, not for the actual thing, or perhaps they were also for revolution in general. Um, and we focused on, uh, we came to focus in on movements um, because it in fact does a lot of different kinds of work, not just a breadth of work disciplinarily, which you will definitely see amongst us on the panel today, um, but it does something that I would argue virtually any key word does critically, which is it is both a term that opens possibilities for analysis and understanding that are new, and it can also work to obscure those possibilities. So we have tried to set up a panel for you that both looks at movements in its most opening and capacious sense, 
Um, and this gesture is um, directly toward dance. As some of you know, the Barnard Center for Research on Women um, sponsored a conference on uh, feminism and disability last spring, and we named it Movements, mm -hmm. Feminism and Disability, um, basically through the influence of Simi Linton, who um, uh, through her, both her book, My Body Politic, and also her organizational work around dance encouraged us to think of dance as a particularly uh, as a particular site of social change and if what social movements do is is provide sites for social change we wanted to look more broadly at the way that all kinds of embodied movements provide possibilities for social change and for the recognition the symbolization the embodiment if you will of social relations so that capaciousness of the term movements was what made us focus on it instead of, for example, activism. Um, and at the same time, I think that one of the things that we'll also see this afternoon is a real question about movements. I don't know, Dorian is a, a trained social movements person. The rest of us are, are fellow travelers, so I don't know how much he'll go into the old social movements, the new social movements, the new new social movements, um, and the like. But one of the things that, that um, we want to think about is whether the attribution of the word or term movement to a particular set of social relations or a particular phenomenon actually covers over that which is most in need of analytic focus. Um, so we want to look at both those types of work, both the opening and the um, containing work that our keyword might do today, and we hope out of that to have a more critical discussion afterwards. So each of our speakers will speak for exactly 12 minutes, <laughs> um, and I have a thing that says stop now in case they think they're going to go over. Um, and then we'll have conversation amongst them and with all of you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm Paul Scalieri. Janet asked me to speak first because she thought my topic was most capacious, which I understand to be a key word for <laughs> out there. So. <laughs> So, as with many fields in the humanities and social sciences, dance studies concerns itself with the historical, cultural, and social formations of power and agency, domination and resistance, identity and representation. Often, it pursues this concern by asking questions about the dynamics between physical movement and social or political movements. It asks, how does physical movement, improvised or choreographed, enact symbolize or resist social change? How is dancing in particular a means of embodying political ideology? How does kinesthetics link to consciousness? And how is movement, as distinct from linguistic and visual forms of expression, different, or how does um, kinesthetics differently shape our perceptions of and actions within social and political realities? How is mobility or the experiences of immobility a way of knowing? And finally, how do theatrical, social, or sacred choreographies offer critical perspectives into the histories of social conflict, conflict and political oppression? So with my remaining, I guess, 10 minutes, I thought I would um, just touch upon four areas within dance scholarship that, is animated by, um, that are animated by some of these questions. So the first, one of the central preoccupations within dance studies is to understand how dance traditions are responses to political and social conflict. That is to say, how are certain traditions or choreographies actually reflect and born out of social crisis? So there are innumerable examples I could give. In my own research, which deals with 16th century experiences or perceptions of dance between Europeans and indigenous cultures in Mexico largely, what I look at is how movement actually informed each other's um, experiences of alterity and of difference. And one of the areas that I was most interested in was looking at the formation of what's called dances de conquista, or conquest dances. These are dances that were actually formed in the immediate aftermath of the conquest that in fact reenacted the conquest itself, or military scenes of violence. So this began as a, a we see this throughout Central America, broadly, but particularly in Mexico, how dance and choreography was instituted and managed by church and colonial authorities as a way for indigenous cultures to indeed reenact, perform, and rehearse their own domination, and sometimes even performing the role of conquistadors or colonizers themselves. This sometimes t took its shape as literal reenactments of battle scenes. 
Um, but within that also, there's a way to understand, or what I'm interested in, how within those choreographies, there's a way of actually enacting resistance. And um, within, you know, within 500 years since the conquest, today in Mexico, throughout Central America, we see that these dances of conquista are continually performed, um, sometimes in local communities and church patios. And the question becomes, how is it that this narrative of domination continues to be performed? What experiences of history are lived and embodied through this performance of conquest? In itself, what's fascinating is that one of the defining moments in the history of the conquest of Mexico is in fact memorialized through a story about a dance. I can't necessarily go into all of its details, but it essentially involves a conspiracy um, where um, the Mexica, also known as the Aztec, were performing one of its most sacred rituals, and it was at that moment that um, Pedro de Alvarado, one of the leading conquistadors, decided to mobilize his forces to attack the, um, the Mexica um, ritual celebrants. What's fascinating about this is that there's, this is not necessarily made convincing social history, but the fact that the story of violence and encounter gets continually memorialized through these dances is one that fascinates me and animates a lot of research within the, the larger field of dance studies. Um, I also want to point to another example that involves um, American indigenous cultures, and that would be the types of what are sometimes called revitalist movements or messianic movements, movements <clears throat> that were actually responses to particularly colonialism where dance, in addition to music, to poetry, um, actually created what we might say are paratopias or alternate sites of consciousness, creating different worlds in order to cope with and respond to the pressures of colonialism. I think one of the most dynamic and illustrative examples involves the ghost dance ritual in late 19th century in the United States within the Dakotas, which involved uh, an actual um, movement, a, a, a resistance movement that was started by a Sioux Indian um, medicine man named Wovaka, who actually um, began to preach that through dancing and through song, that um, the, the Sioux Indians could actually recreate a universe or imagine a world that would be repopulated by buffalo, and that would be retaken over from the white man, from territories from which they had been displaced. So these were performed within reservations that had been established throughout ni late 19th century, particularly within the 1880s. And um, this links back to even earlier revitalist movements in the 16th century, the Taquion Coy within Peru, Cantares Mexicanos in Mexico. These were early instantiations of using dance as a way to resist and create altered awareness and forms of political resistance to domination. So that's just one example. Another example, um, oh, I do want to say a parallel just to remind that, that it was actually the ghost, a ghost dance ritual that initiated the Battle of Wounded Knee on December 29th, 1890, which was the last major encounter between Native Americans and the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. So there's this way that the story of conquest and this resistance for post-colonialism both get um, intimately um, involved narratives of dance. Another approach considers or draws upon movement and choreographic analysis to understand how individual and mass or individual movements figure into political and social protests. By this I mean looking at how v various forms of activism, um, whether it's political protests or sit-ins or demonstrations, actually use dance or choreography and movement to do what um, political scientist Jean Sharp describes, to create interference by physical bodies. This often involves the study of how bodies are deployed to raise consciousness and to elicit identification within the public sphere. And I'm going to give you one example, there are many, but I think one of the most powerful examples um, involves a group of women in Chile during the 1970s under the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, where one of the major strategies um, of terrorism was through acts of uh, disappearance, where any dissidents, particularly men, but of course women as well, were literally disappeared, that their bodies were um, taken away from their families and tortured, as we learned later, and hidden. Um, it was during this time that Pinochet's government actually, by decree, made a dance called the Cueca, the national dance associated with his movement. Now, the Cueca is a, is a folk dance that often is a couple's dance between a man and a woman. Some say it, it animates the story of a rooster chasing a hen. Others say it's about the choreographic design imitates weaving patterns or agricultural patterns. Whatever it might mean, the point was that it was nationalized to represent Pinochet's um, uh, government. What was so um, remarkable was how a group of women, the wives, the mothers, the daughters, the friends of disappeared men, gathered in local plazas 
in local uh, cultural centers and began to perform their version of the cueca called La Cueca Sola, the, 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 the cueca alone. And part of what was so chilling and powerful about this movement was how women performed this partner dance um, alone, sometimes wearing photographs of mm. their loved ones who had disappeared, and carrying a white handkerchief over the space where their disappeared ones would be. This, in fact, not only asserting their presence, but in fact a way of marking the absence of those disappeared. Mm. And um, of course, there's some really fascinating research going on in this area. I point to one Susan Foster has studied, which she calls the choreographies of protest, which looks at the way that the choreographic dimensions of sit-ins and die-ins, such as ACT UP during the AIDS crisis, and especially among freedom riders, the way that um, the, um, the choreograph choreographic aspects of nonviolent um, uh, um, responses to violence among the freedom riders during the 1940s through the 1960s, and how certain physical or body training was part of the process for coping with um, forms of aggression. A third approach um, would be um, looking at the dynamics between physical and social movements, um, I'm sorry, a third approach to examining the dynamics between physical and social movements looks at the perception of movement and bodies, our own and others, looking into how our constructions of political and social realities are embodied and corporealized. This work is predominantly carried out by movement and dance analysts in collaboration with psychologists and increasingly neuroscientists that are looking how movement, like rhetoric, figures into our perceptions of reliability and deception, or how movement actually elicits our sympathy and alliance. Um, quite simply, this research asks, what moves us? Some of the most compelling research in this area, to my mind, was pioneered by Martha Davis, who ex extensively studied what she calls movement signature analysis, which is looking at the patterns of dynamics and physicality among political, religious, and social figures, and understanding how those are used to create um, follow followers. Um, I should also say this research is also applied more increasingly within um, the criminal system. There's a course at John Jay College now that deals specifically with how movement is actually brought into the courtrooms, um, dealing with um, uh, experts, jury um, consultants, trying to read juries. Or perhaps also, interestingly, it, although it's not um, uh, a, um, admissible in court, how um, within New York, uh, accused murderers, as they're giving their testimony, are actually analyzed in terms of movement to understand their own deception. This, too, has implications in the social realm. But the fourth area of research I'd want to just mention is the focus, and this is a really um, increasingly um, rich area, is the role of dance within communities of crisis, especially and increasingly in refugee centers throughout the world, where dance is used as a way to help those who are displaced um, maintain a cultural identity, but also as a means to use dance as a way to express traumatic um, trauma and violence sometimes those experiences which are beyond discourse. So there's, uh, I just want to mention three um, refugee centers. One is the Ibda in Palestine, the ARD in Colombia, and the Center for Dance, um, broadly, and, and music, in the Sudan, um, <clears throat> where dance and researchers and activists are gathering to use art as a way to cope with um, the pressures of um, uh, social oppression. In, in these different um, centers, dancing is both a way to rehearse resiliency and a practice of liberation. So in order to get to what Janet was saying, am I okay? Two minutes? Okay. Um, <clears throat> in order to get at what Janet was saying about the way movement opens up and closes, and this is something I'm always tripping up because dance, not all dance, uh, not all movement is dance, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but thinking about um, one of the reasons that dance has been, I think, relegated to the periphery of social analysis is precisely because dance does not necessarily leave a trace. It is ephemeral, it disappears, it escapes certain technologies of capture, and therefore it is not always a reliant way of analyzing the social. But to conclude, I want a, a, a passage to me that has really oriented my way of thinking about dance and its relationship to um, social movement. Um, was iterated by Franz Fanon in Wretched of the Earth, who in writing about colonial Africa says, any study of the colonial world should take into consideration the phenomena of dance and possession. For Fanon, 
um, what he was actually saying, which is in some way the inverse of what I was saying, he was lamenting the way that dance and possession within colonial Africa, particularly North Africa, was actually exhausting political momentum, that there was a way that dance in its creation of different, um, creating altered consciousness and ways of knowing, actually circumscribed political um, vitality. And part of what I was outlining here were the ways that dance was actually, hopefully, its potential for liberation and for freedom. Yet, where I think we both agree is that it's actually at the level of um, movement, at the level of the body, where these power dynamics get acted out, exchanged, negotiated, and represented. So I will leave it there. Thank okay. you. So a couple of caveats before I start. The first is when I was asked to participate in this panel, I initially said no and that the organizer should invite Deborah Minkoff, who is a sociologist at Barnard and Columbia and is um, the social movement scholar, I think, on campus. And she was also my teacher in graduate school. So everything I know about social movements comes from Deborah Minkoff which means if there's anything you violently disagree with, you can blame her. <laughs> and anything you do agree with, you can, I'll take credit for. Um, but she's on leave. She is on leave, which is why she's not here. Um, the, the other thing I want to say is these reflections about the word, the term, the keyword movements comes from not only the scholarship in sociology and political science, but also from community organizers who are seeking to start a movement. And um, so the background to that is I'm, I'm on the board of an organization called the Center for Community Change based in Washington, D.C. And it serves as sort of the, the Washington representative for thousands, or hundreds really, of grassroots community organizations across the country. And we engaged in a series of study groups and conversations over the last eight months all about social movements. So we read the literature um, in an effort to try to figure out how to build a movement or how to start a movement. So a lot of these reflections come out of that study group um, that a few of us participated in with organizers. So definitions, a couple of definitions from political scientists and sociologists. So one definition from political scientist uh, Laurel Weldon, and here I'm placing the word social and or political in front of the word movements. Social movements are forms of political or social mobilization in which membership and action is based on a shared sense of purpose and or identity aimed at changing social practices or prevailing power relations. One definition. Another definition by our erstwhile colleague Charles Tilley, who um, was the, one of the giant figures in the field of social movement research and sociology. Tilly defines social movements as a series of contentious performances, displays and campaigns by which ordinary people make collective claims on others. For Tilly, social movements are a major vehicle for ordinary people's participation in politics. And he argues there are three major elements to a social movement, campaigns, repertoire, and what he calls WUNC displays. That's an acronym I'll come back to. So campaigns are a sustained, organized public effort making collective claims on target authorities. Repertoire is the deployment of combinations from among the following forms of political or social action. The creation of special purpose associations and coalitions, public meetings, vigils, rallies, demonstrations, petition drives, statements to and in the public media, and pamphleteering. And then finally, this term WNC displays. Participants concerted public representation of worthiness, unity, numbers, and commitments on the part of themselves and or their constituencies. So that's one definition by Chuck Tilley of social movements. His colleague, Sidney Taro, who's also uh, a, considered a giant in the field and also Tilley's co-author, define social movement in this way, and not the plural, but the singular. A social movement is a collective challenge to elites, authorities, other groups, or cultural codes 
by people with common purposes and solidarity and sustained interaction with elites, opponents, and authorities. And Terrell is quick to distinguish social movements from political parties or interest groups. There's something very, very different. Now, through these study groups and discussion with community organizers over the last eight months, we came up with what we think are six elements of social movements. So I'm adding more numbers here, but six elements of movements. The first one is clarity of purpose. Successful social movements, emphasis on successful, successful social movements radiate a sense of purpose from every pore. In some instances, this purpose corresponds to a specific realizable goal, so regime change in Egypt. In other cases, the animating purpose is a broader mission or big idea about the change needed in the world. Whatever the defining purpose may be, a movement communicates it at multiple levels, through internal education, public statements, collective actions, cultural products, and even through organizational forms and structures. So that's the first element, clarity of purpose. The second element is relentless outreach. Pretty simple concept. Successful social movements are essentially growth machines driven by, we might call it a powerful evangelical impulse to recruit others to the cause. So relentless outreach, number two. Number three, learning space. Lawrence Goodwin has a great description of the populist movement as a schoolroom that could apply to most social movements. So each successful social movement has found ways to create spaces for authentic conversation, debate, and reflection that gives political meaning to personal experience. Other scholars refer to this as spaces that create oppositional consciousness in many ways. Now this function is not just an outgrowth of movements, but it's critical to movement formation because it's the way that most people come to understand and assimilate purpose. And the learning process itself offers intrinsic value to movement participants. The learning spaces help construct a collective identity for movement participants. Fourth element is leadership. And here, leadership and leadership qualities required or generated by a social movement are different from those that are typically cultivated by other kinds of organizations. So rather than strict accountability to task and role like a CEO or an executive director of an organization, movement leadership is often characterized by resourcefulness, creativity, wide freedom of action within boundaries defined by a clear purpose, and leadership, at least in the movement context or as organizers and scholars like to think of, leadership, the role movements play in leadership is in developing leaders. So often we think of charismatic leaders as the head of movements, but an alternative understanding of leadership is one in which you develop organic leaders that play roles at the local level, often not seen when people are analyzing movements, but the role of developing new leaders from particular oppositional spaces is very important. So that's number four. Two more. Number five is cellular structures. That is, most large social movements are networks of small pods comprised of people deeply connected to each other. We might think of these as circles of caring that are responsible for many critical movement functions. They offer peer support, assimilation of worldview and ideology, the modeling of values and behavior, they recruit new participants, develop autonomous local activities, and obviously mobilize people for collective action. So these are separate from the spaces I mentioned earlier. These structures are, are essentially these circles of caring that connect people and have deep, meaningful connections to each other. Last but not least, popular media. Every social movement, at least in the modern age, has had at least one and often several forms of mass media that allowed it to communicate effectively with participants as well as project its goals to broader audience, audiences. In addition to projecting its, its purposes and its goals and making claims upon the state or other elites, the media play a key role in providing cultural validation to a movement, 
giving it an aura of authority and scope. Now, it's important to point out that these media need not be owned by movement organizations, but they need at least to be closely aligned with the movement's purpose to at least cover some of the demands that movements are making. So the, the last two things, two things I'll say that are elements of social movements, as I think sociologists in particular think about it, is the role of organizations and organizers. So in terms of organizations, and there's a long-standing debate in the, in the social movement literature on this question, there's a, there's a long-standing debate over the relationship between organizations and movement with very fierce partisans on both sides. We might think of the classic um, Francis Fox Piven and Richard Clower view that movements emerge spontaneously and that actually that formal organizations uh, constrain movements versus others that think, and this is the resource mobilization school, that you actually need organizations to sprout and nurture uh, movements and that's how they emerge. Movement organizations often have the capacity to assemble resources and help to germinate movements, but it's, for us, I think, in the scholarship, it's unclear, this debate is unclear in the sense of, is it true that particular movement organizations can will movements into place, or is there some trigger once an organization has been doing many of these things I described earlier that then sprouts or launches a movement, allows it to emerge often unpredictably? And the last point uh, I'll make just on this is that movements need organizers as well as organizations. Um, and that is related to the leadership development question. They, movements need people that will connect others, that recruit people. And we have to think about the role of these unique individuals in broad-based social movements. One more point, um, and that is as, as someone that studies the American labor movement or organized labor, um, I often find it interesting why both practitioners and scholars refer to labor in this country as the labor movement, because it doesn't seem like a movement these days and, and hasn't for at least 50, 70 years. But the, it raises the question, well, why do, why do people refer to, to organized labor not as an interest group, which I think it more that's really what it is, but of a movement? And in fact, the, the recent scholarship analyzing the American labor movement where scholars often suggest that the way to revitalize labor is for labor to become more of a social movement union, or unions to become more social movement unions as opposed to business unions. That's sort of the prescriptive, uh, the pres prescription from scholars saying, this is the way labor is gonna revitali revitalize itself to become a movement, social movement unionism. So it's just an interesting theme in the literature on the labor movement, at least at this particular historical moment when it's very, clear that there isn't a broad-based labor movement. Well, uh, it's great to follow you, uh, but embarrassing in certain ways, which I'll say. Um, I have to confess that I found myself very worried when Everybody said I had to talk about movements um, because I associate this with political activists and I associate it with sociologists and I'm neither of those. Uh, so in the spirit, you know, we all rise to the challenge, in the spirit of uh, questioning keywords, I thought it might be useful to reflect on why both as an anthropologist uh, and as someone who's been analyzing feminist initiatives and more lately, revolutions in the Middle East and the Muslim world, I've never actually felt comfortable using the term. What does it refer to? What does it do for who to use a term like this? Um, so I'm going to sort of uh, tell you a little bit about why I'm confused or why I get suspicious when I uh, 
hear the term uh, using three examples from my own work um, in Egypt and the broader Muslim world, and I apologize because your talk was so inspiring uh, and yours was so clear, and I thought, boy, I really am ignorant because I don't, I, you know, I'm talking about movement. The reason I don't know, I'm confused by it is because I actually don't know the literature, but I'll take it from there and see what you think. So my first association, uh, of course, with the term is, is, is in resistance movements, which I'm all in favor of, and I like <laughs> that idea. But I've actually never done field work in communities that were involved in resistance movements or any kind of political activity. I, I guess that's changing now, but I hadn't. Uh, early on, I was interested in resistance to power in the everyday, studying the way one community of women and young men used poetry to challenge certain forms of control. At the same time, though, I recognized that they were also totally committed to that moral system and that somehow this poetry uh, was part of their insistence on adherence to the system even while it was a form of resistance. So I then got very suspicious about um, the way resistance was being celebrated in academic work, um, this was the sort of 1980s, as people I think were disillusioned or disappointed with the outcomes of revolutions, anti-colonial resistance movements or leftist movements. So people like James Scott and the Komarov seem to be using forms of everyday resistance as a way to validate and affirm activism and agency, but it was activism without activists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a kind of romance with resistance, is what I called it, that I thought we ought to be suspicious of. Should we really confuse foot dragging mm -hmm. and slave plantation songs with political movements seeking to change the order of things? I wasn't sure. So it seemed to me that celebrating resistance uh, might be an easy way to affirm one's own progressiveness without actually supporting any actual political movements uh, or social movements. So um, that was the first uh, non-movement part of my life. Uh, but a more recent suspicious encounter with movements came as I was studying, uh, as I have been for the last uh, many years, uh, feminist projects in the Muslim world. And I was struck by the very eager work of a couple of groups of highly educated cosmopolitan Muslim women uh, to promote women's rights and equality through Islam. And among the most interesting initiatives I looked at, very well funded, as are many NGOs dedicated to empowering women across the Muslim world, among them are w something called WISE the Women's Islamic Initiative for Spirituality and Equality, which is based here in New York at the God Box on Claremont, and Musawa, which means equality. Um, anyway, I'll go on. So the publicity material for the latter, for Musawa explains, Musawa is a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family, calling for equality, non-discrimination, justice and dignity as the basis of all human relations, full and equal citizenship for every individual, and marriage and family relations based on principles of equality and justice with men and women sharing equal rights and responsibilities." Unquote. So this is the self-declared global movement uh, is the brainchild of a dozen highly educated Muslim feminists and scholars from different countries. And it grew out of the work of a very interesting organization based in Malaysia mm -hmm. called Sisters in Islam. But, you know, I was sort of asking myself, in what sense is this a global movement? Doesn't a global movement need a grassroots base, wide support? Musawa's self-declared um, self launch uh, and both of these organizations has la had launches in Kuala Lumpur. In 2009, uh, Musawa has included 250 men and women. And I wonder, do movements have launches? Mm. Um, <laughs> is there more to Musawa than a website and some publications, a framework for action, some articles and pamphlets by scholars, and most recently a publication, very interesting, called Sida and Muslim Family Law, Search for Common Ground. So, you know, I asked my, you know, am I being cynical, uh, am I being narrow-minded, too literal, when I have in the back of my mind an association with, of the keyword movement with, uh, not dance, I hadn't, but uh, with something more organic, something bigger, something more directed towards, uh, you know, 
an elite, a uh, government, uh, uh, something, uh, you know, a change the order. Does one declare oneself a movement, or is that something that others notice about you, uh, that you are a movement, you have become a movement? Is that a kind of <laughs> social fact, mm -hmm. or, is, or do you declare it? So that was the sort of second moment there. And finally, most recently, as the world watched the uprisings uh, that toppled regimes uh, around the Arab world, I found myself, again, suspicious of the way events were being portrayed, even if, you know, as amazed and pleased to see, you know, people power on the streets uh, and happy to, you know, more than happy to see uh, the regime's fall that did. Uh, but these are very complex events, uh, and there are people in the room who know more about this even than I do. Uh, but, and like any major political upheaval, involve the coming together of many, many groups with different motives, different demands, and it remains to be seen in each of the cases how things are going to fall out, like the, you know, Islamic Revolution in Iran. You know, there are a lot of different groups involved, but, you know, what did it end up being? Mm -hmm. But let me just give you a sense from what I know about Egypt about what nags me. I'm not sure what the relationship is between these revolutions uh, as they call themselves, or I don't know, other, they call themselves, or other people, Thawra, Thawra, Hatta Nasr, you know, they call themselves revolution, and the movements that contributed to making them happen. Uh, what's the relationship? And in Egypt, uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Rabab al-Mahdi, who's coming to speak on Saturday uh, at the Barnard Center for Research on Women's 40th Anniversary Conference on Activism in the Academy, uh, she is a professor of political science and an activist, longtime activist in various circles. Um, she was in Tahrir Square, and so I'm very anxious to have the conversation with her about how she sees this. She's also a student of social movements. She writes about that. But she was involved um, in an earlier pro-democracy group in 2004, a group called the Movement for Change, uh, whose slogan was Kifaya, enough. You know, we've had enough of this regime. They were called for democratization, they called for elections, they called for the end of the Mubarak dynasty, dynastic reign, you know, that his son shouldn't be the next one. It was relatively small, it was middle class, it included activists, she says, of various political stripes, but it was definitely middle class. Um, mostly educated uh, intellectuals. It's demonstrations which mobilized, she says, at most 2,500 people uh, were violently broken up by security thugs and the movement sort of fizzled and I think some of the bloggers left the country and da da da. But um, at the same time that this was happening, actually predating it a bit, um, there was also what could, what could be called workers' movement uh, in Egypt, uh, very serious uh, strikes, actions by workers in the big textile factories uh, that for various reasons was not suppressible in the same way that the little group that mobilized in Tahrir could easily be dismissed. Uh, this political activism over work conditions, over salaries, under unemployment, over you know the loss of benefits, neoliberalism, uh, all the economic problems that Egyptian uh, Egyptians in neoliberal Egypt were facing, it was really critical to what happened in January, last January, even if I think, uh, and I didn't really watch all the coverage, so you can tell me if I'm wrong, but even I, if I think, as, as I think was the case, the Western media paid much more attention to the Google executive, mm -hmm. Wael Ghanem, and the Facebook organizing by some of uh, the same people who were involved in the earlier group, Kefaya. Uh, those interviewed, obviously, are those who could present this in English uh, as a democracy movement assimilable to American and European liberal ideologies. We want good governance, we want democracy, we want elections, we want civil society, uh, and less about the economic system or the geopolitical alignments that linked Egypt to the United States. And by branding this the Arab Spring, and I'm sure some of you can 